Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org. Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I'm Jean Till, and on today's show, we're visiting with Dan Balserak, the Director of Religious Liberty and Assistant General Counsel for the USCCB on recent Supreme Court decisions. Well, good morning, Jean. Yeah. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> so I'm like, you just kind of left it there. I know. Like, well, I'm just so, like, holy so, moly, so this sobering. is a lot. Yeah, so well, it'll be a big gulp today. That's but, right, uh, on that's a, right. On a more lighter note, but uh, yeah. really a pleasure to celebrate the Silver Jubilee Mass for Sister Rini Sumethi, a little missionary of the Sacred Heart. Oh, and wonderful. And she and her sisters at the Bishop mm-hmm. Drama serve so mm-hmm. well, but she's such a joyful woman and uh, at St. Pius X last week, and it was a grand occasion. I think, you know, just affirming that call to consecrated life and how it's mm-hmm. so lived out well in an ethic of service to the, the sick and the infirm in a very beautiful way. And to be open. I mean, everyone needs to be open to what God's asking them to do. Yeah. And I think, we, you know. Because little... God doesn't want us to be happy. You know, he just wants to scrunch our happiness right. well, and, and, and we limit really, our freedom. And we know so much better <laughs> yes. than yeah. what God does. I mean, it's like, really, we yeah. just have to journal about it. And we're good to go. Yeah, right. right? You know, it's like, <laughs> no, if we just, our, our kids yeah. are open to what God wants them to do. Yeah. Then if God's calling them, they'll be called. Right. Yeah. And, and their happiness. And I think mm-hmm. that's something we see, you know, as I was visiting some of our seminarians heading off. You know, for some of their parents are like, oh, yeah, let's right. see, you know. But I think once they see that they're, they're, they're becoming more themselves mm-hmm. in the beautiful way, the goodness that's already there. And they just there's a peace and a happiness. So I think that's uh, yep. something that Sister Rini uh, radiates in a beautiful way. And we were at Dallas Catholic for the Mass of the Holy Spirit. Hopefully get it charged up there, so it'll mm-hmm. be great. And then something new for me tomorrow, I don't know. I'm going to talk about going into my discomfort zone. But, yes. Uh, a quinceanera Mass that we're sponsoring yes. for the diocese. So young women who've reached that uh, threshold of life mm-hmm. and uh, affirming their relationship in Jesus. We know lots of the parishes, and some of our parish priests celebrate multiple quinceaneras. Women mm-hmm. you know, often want to have that as a kind of solitary uh, experience with their family and friends. But uh, to do this as a diocesan family at uh, mm-hmm. St. Ambrose Cathedral. So we'll see, you know. And, of course, I have a little help with the translation of this into Spanish. Yep. But um, they're always very forgiving of me and appreciate that uh, I try to speak their tongue and not mine. And September, football <laughs> in the air. Here we go. It's an exciting time. We've been waiting, some of us. The, the sweltering heat of August has yielded. And, and the uh, practices. Oh, my word. Oh, yeah. Did they get I mean, out at 4 o'clock in the morning to do their practices? Well, they should. The only cool they time. should, you know, with the, with the lights on and mm-hmm. everything else. And the cross-country runners and football players as well. And uh, both at the high school and college levels. We know Valley Catholic has a big match against uh, Valley coming up, a game in Valley. And, of course, at St. Albert Catholic School yes. in Council Bluffs. A lot of excitement in the air with their new coach, uh, Donnie Woods. A man known of the various uh, high schools, but uh, particularly Iowa Western Community College, great success as offensive line coordinator, and uh, also uh, assisting at other schools. But then a stint helping in the U.S. Football League in Birmingham, Alabama, where he is vice president of football operations. So him saying yes, he saying yes, and he's also communication director at St. Albert. So Very I cool. had a chance to meet him. He's obviously impressive of stature, but he has his bearing. I'm sure he'll command the respect of the young men. And uh, as they'll be taking on West Monona this weekend. And so uh, we wish them success in this season and hopefully maybe kind of writing their fortunes back to that uh, grand tradition that they have as well. And then a little bit, uh, you know, our Regents University is obviously not Catholic, but uh, many of our listeners devoted. And, Go uh, Hawks. Yeah. Oh, oh no. okay. Fight oh, Gene, yeah. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Well, next week's going to be a particularly <laughs> chilly one for us here on the studio. But the, the Hawkeyes <laughs> warming up with Utah State and the Cyclones, their in-state rival, who usually uh, gives them uh, all they can ask for and then some, the UNI Panthers. Uh, so that'll be a, a great way. Mm-hmm. And uh, we know for our Spirit Catholic Radio people, uh, the, uh, the Huskers, Hope Springs Eternal with Coach Matt Rule, and uh, right. hopefully the, the, the storied history of Nebraska football uh, again, this show appearing afterwards. I don't know if we're going to have to make, as I said on a previous show, make some provision for that, you know. But unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes the pre-record will not allow us to do so. But anyway, yeah. on to more weighty matters. <laughs> <laughs> when we return, we will be visiting with Dan Balstrack. He's the Religious Liberty Council for the USCCB and the Assistant General Council. And we're going to be talking about the Supreme Court decisions that came down the summer. 
That and more here on Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. And on today's show, we're visiting with Dan Balsarak. He is the Religious Liberty Council for the USCCB and the Assistant General Council. And we're talking about Supreme Court decisions. Yes, uh, a summer of great uh, intensity on lots of levels and great heat. Some of that was generated by some of the decisions that came down in late <laughs> June of the Supreme Court as well. We're very grateful to have Mr. Dan Balsarak back. Uh, he's been with us before on the show and we know within the Iowa Catholic Radio family that uh, Deacon Mike Mano also sometimes addresses legal mm-hmm. issues. But to appreciate having Dan's uh, perspective on things, uh, kind of in the forefront with policy and advocacy and uh, religious liberty and education as this in general counsel. Sometimes we overlap a little bit with the Committee on Education for the USCCB. But, uh, Dan, uh, can you just bring us up to speed? Uh, you uh, you and your wife survived your four kids this summer and all the different things <laughs> and, and your day job besides. <laughs> We did. Uh, thank you for having me back. Yeah, our our toddler uh, Gus is um, uh, in, interested particularly in um, biting people right now. So that's been, <laughs> yes, that sounds that's be about two. He's a young vampire then, huh? Yeah, well, it's <laughs> dinosaur dinosaur to be precise. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. T Rex uh, yeah. in the household loose. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, it's been um, a, a p- perhaps nothing is going to top last summer with Dobbs in terms of the uh, mm. the, the heat generated um, by the Supreme Court. But this summer did produce some, some notable opinions, for sure. Um, mm. And there's still a lot of gnashing of teeth with Dobbs, obviously, and uh, the political ramifications. Yeah, there, but. Absolutely, and that I, I don't think will go away anytime soon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... Uh, one of the, the and we speak about the, the realm of education, the decision mm-hmm. that involved uh, both Harvard University and University of North Carolina, and we think about the the Mackey decision in terms of affirmative action of some thirty years ago, but a uh, rather dramatic change there. Can you fill us in? Yeah. So this was uh, a a pretty significant uh, decision. Uh, technically, not. Exactly overruling the Supreme Court's previous decisions that upheld affirmative action uh, policies at universities, but certainly making it difficult for universities to continue to 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 do that. Um, the case involved challenges to affirmative action policies at both Harvard and UNC, where applicants essentially got a uh, a bump in their score uh, based on their race. Um, and the decision was a, a 6-3 uh, decision authored by Justice Roberts um, that decided the case on uh, equal protection grounds, so constitutional grounds, saying you know, the, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment um, prohibits discrimination based on race, and that's what this is. Um, the uh, it's sort of notable that they decided the case on equal te- equal protection grounds um, because there is a statutory basis for, for deciding uh, the issues. Title VI prohibits race discrimination and reaching a constitutional issue when there's a statutory way to resolve um, a case is uh, a, a bit contrary to the sort of judicial minimalism um, uh, philosophy that Justice Roberts especially tends to espouse, but I think there were probably some procedural wrinkles that that produced that outcome. Okay. Uh, so some of that's inside baseball, but that's a fact that uh, was not drawn out for some of us. So uh, yeah. to go to that level, and, and Justice Roberts had a, a much more prominent role in uh, crafting the majority of uh, opinions this time, I think, than some previous uh, terms of the Supreme Court. Is that correct? Yeah, so uh, this is Justice Roberts sort of making good on his previous statement um, that the way to stop discriminating on race is to stop discriminating on race. Um, there, uh, I, I should say, you know, there's a, as with many issues, a diversity of opinions among Catholics and among Catholic organizations about affirmative action. Um, the USCCB did not file an amicus brief on this case, but a, a very large coalition of Catholic universities did, 
mm-hmm. in support of Harvard and UNC. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a uh, you know a, a, a and came out immediately after it was released with a with a press release uh, critical yeah. of the decision. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you said it doesn't quite overturn previous uh, uh, statutes in this regard or previous uh, opinions. What what's the distinction there? Well, the, this is a pattern that we've seen with a couple different cases recently um, where the, the court will stop short of officially saying you know, this previous case is overruled, but they will essentially gut the, the continued viability of the case. Um, so they, here they did not say Gruder, which was a, a previous affirmative action case, is overruled, but they said, well, but, what Harvard and UNC are doing violates the Equal Protection Clause, um, Grutter notwithstanding. So it's just hard to see the relevance of Grutter anymore. Okay. All right. So at least a, a patina of stare decisis, if uh, my Latin is not limping too much there? <laughs> <laughs> Correct, yes. Okay. Uh, upholding precedent as much as possible without before <laughs> dramatically overturning it. Uh, North Carolina, the uh, Board of Trustees or Board of Regents, whatever the body is called, uh, went, certainly complied in a very uh, explicit way. Harvard, maybe less so, and some other institutions seem that they're now going to be continually uh, testing the, the limits of, of some of this as well in terms of their essays and some of the prompts that uh, many major institutions now in response uh, to the decision. So what do you anticipate? Uh, I, I think you're you're right to note that the... Uh, uh, Justice Roberts' opinion did say, um, you know, race can be relevant to admissions if it is part of an applicant's story about how they overcame adversity and how that would be relevant to their strengths as a student um, or things like that. So you can – race can be part of the applicant's story – but it cannot be a factor just on its face. The, the skin color of an applicant alone cannot be um, a factor. I do imagine we are going to see test cases or, or test policies sort of probing the, the limits uh, of how far universities can go, um, and especially some claims about uh, pretext. So, you know, uh, a university wants... Um, applicants to submit a video. Well, one, ap- <laughs> <laughs> one benefit of a video is that you can see the skin color of the applicant. Yeah. Um, Though that yeah, is the I, medium that uh, most of our young people work in, you know. That's the, true. Thing, so. At least, at le- hopefully they don't have to submit TikToks. Okay, mm. please, please. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, as, a, as a Catholic, I, I think, yeah, one story, the hardships that one's endured, uh, perhaps... Uh, Immigration from another place, uh, racial uh, challenges that one to face, that is part of the, the complex of someone's identity. And uh, uh, I'm not adverse to having that be part of the consideration. We think some of our young people here in, in the Des Moines Diocese, you know, who've, uh, whether they've gone to Holy Family School or other places, some impressive young people and some of the uh, things they've had to overcome to, to claim their rightful place and the opportunities afforded there. Let's move on. Uh, I don't know if it's a as much as a religious freedom or a free speech, a free not to speak uh, in any way, uh, the creative LLC versus Alanis, if I'm uh, quote, citing that correctly. Right, yeah, 303 Creative. Uh, this was officially a free speech case, um, but it certainly has religious liberty overtones. So this was a case coming out of Colorado where a website designer named Lori Smith uh, wanted to uh, sort of expand her business into the wedding website uh, arena. And she had the, the good sense to think, well, I wonder if Colorado will let me do that without designing uh, custom websites for same-sex couples. Um, so she sought a determination from from Colorado, and they said, no, you can't. If you go into the wedding website business, you have to make the, the websites for, uh, for same-sex couples. And so she filed a lawsuit. Um, Do you think court. it was kind of a provocative gesture on her part that, that sometimes these cases arise because people are really 
trying to maybe call the question and that uh, it's less a, a bona fides, uh, you know, attempt to, to really be a, a business, a small businesswoman? You know, I don't, I don't think so. Um, uh, I, there's nothing in the record to suggest that Lori Smith was acting on anything other than good faith. Um, I, 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 I hate to get polemical, um, but if there's a, a, a side that is uh, being provocative on this issue, especially in Colorado, um, it is the those who would seek to make people like Lori Smith uh, design products or, or bake cakes um, that convey messages that they don't agree with. It, we, uh, you, you may be familiar with the story of Jack Phillips, sure. mm -hmm. the, the wedding or the cake master, baker, master cake baker, yeah. yeah, from Masterpiece Cake Shop, who is um, uh, uh, a, a continually suffering figure at this point, sort of inundated with various. Uh, contrived requests to make him bake cakes that say things he disagrees with. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Supreme Court took only the free speech claim. They did not take the religious liberty claim, even though Laurie Smith did, did bring one of those. Um, but they found 6-3 um, uh, uh, in an uh, opinion written by Justice Gorsuch that Colorado cannot apply its non-discrimination law to make Lori Smith say something she disagrees with. So that obviously has some religious liberty results and mm -hmm. relevance, even though it was a, a, a free speech claim per se. Okay. So uh, the right to remain silent has a different connotation <laughs> in this context that we don't, we're not compelled right. to, mm -hmm. to give expression to things that we feel exactly. violate our religious uh, tenets and what we're about. Yeah. Uh, also in the religious vein, uh, maybe just little relevant here with our massive uh, Amazon distribution center here near I-80 and I-35 between Bondurant uh, and the uh, liaison between Amazon and the U.S. Postal Service, Groff DeJoy. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, Groff, v. De excuse me, Groff v. DeJoy was a case um, about the religious non-discrimination requirements in a federal civil rights law called Title VII. And there was an old case uh, from 1972 or 73, I believe, where uh, the Supreme Court had really gutted the, uh, the strength of what Title VII requires um, in terms of how employers must respect their employees' religious exercise. So the, the, the requirement in Title VII itself is uh, employers have to make accommodations for employees' religious exercise uh, unless doing so would impose an undue hardship on the business. And in this old Supreme Court case, uh, there was a line in there that suggested that an undue hardship was as, as little as a de minimis cost or a de minimis burden, so something very small. Uh, and since then, religious... Uh, religious exercise at work has sort of been a second-class right under Title VII. So the Supreme Court, in a unanimous opinion, actually, um, said, look, we didn't really mean de minimis. You're misreading that case. Uh, it, an undue burden here really means that some substantial increased cost. So they, they ruled in favor of Groff uh, and his is a request to be allowed to um, to rest on the Sabbath instead of delivering Amazon packages. Mm -hmm. Now, would there be uh, something in this that, you know, a distinction for Mr. Groff that, you know, to keep the Sabbath holy, and when he accepted employment with the Postal Service, I don't believe he was at that time obliged to deliver on Sunday, but that was a new development, you know, with the pervasive desire, the consumer demand of every day of the week. Um, compare this with a 20-year-old college student who wants to make some money working part-time at Target, signing on knowing that Target is mm -hmm. open on Sunday. Do you see any distinctions there, or is that a distinction without a difference? Um, that's a, I, I think probably will end up a distinction without a difference uh, from a legal point of view, um, from a sort of what does the public think about the case point of view, it, it, there is probably a big difference. 
But in terms of making accommodations, if an applicant applies and says, you know, I, uh, I can't work on Sundays, I think if the employer can make reasonable accommodations without an undue hardship uh, on, on the business, then Title VII, you know, it applies, it applies to hiring as much as firing. Um, mm -hmm. So they would, they would need to consider whether those accommodations can be made. So uh, a Muslim individual who doesn't work, wants, wish to work on Friday evenings or an Orthodox Jew doesn't work on, on the Sabbath, uh, similar uh, uh, conditions apply. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Right. And, and it, you touch on an interesting point. In that, and I'm going to um, ask you to hold that here. We're going to take a quick pause and then uh, we'll round this out and maybe then talk about a little more local uh, cases, too. Sure. Okay? All right. Well, to find out more about the work of the USCCB, go online to usccb.org. We're going to take a quick break here with listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. We injected there, Dan, and you were on a roll, so please complete what you're about there. <laughs> sure. So you had mentioned well, what if the uh, a job applicant knows that the job is going to require something that, uh, that conflicts with their religious beliefs. That is an argument or a, a situation that comes up a lot, and especially in the healthcare context. We see this argument being made, you know, if, you are, if you're not willing to perform abortions, just don't become an OBGYN in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, that, you know, that when, you, when you frame it that way, um, I, I think the, the flaws in that sort of position become clearer. Well, you know, how can you exclude an entire class of people from a particular job field where people with that belief are, are sorely needed? Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And uh, mm -hmm. that point was made, uh, you know, or uh, the alternative position was advanced in the newspaper record here in the recent weeks. So uh, I think that's something that we need to be reminded. And there's now... Uh, grounding in the, the highest level of uh, judicial jurisprudence. Uh, maybe quickly you know, shifting over, I don't know that your position involves uh, attending to all the, the state Supreme Court uh, decisions, but a couple of things here with the religious implications. In New Jersey, Chrissy Tello versus St. Teresa. I'm ignorant of that. Wasn't that the uh, case involved? In New Jersey, not here. New Jersey. Yeah. New Jersey. Did I say Iowa? No, I mean, you New said Jersey. New Jersey. I okay. just want to make sure people pay attention to right. our St. Teresa's. <laughs> not, not your beloved parish. Not my beloved parish. Okay. okay. <laughs> Right, so Chris Tello case in New Jersey, very recent uh, decision from the New Jersey Supreme Court um, where a Catholic school teacher was terminated um, when she became pregnant out of wedlock. Uh, the case did involve some First Amendment uh, religious liberty claims, but was uh, decided on a question of state law, where there was a, uh, a provision in the state's non-discrimination law saying, well, religious employers are allowed to make relig uh, employment decisions um, in connection with their and, and set employment criteria in connection with their religious beliefs, and the court said, well, that's exactly what happened here. Whether we, you know, whether you agree with the beliefs or not, their the school's motivation for terminating the teacher clearly was an exercise of their religious beliefs. Okay, all right. So within their proper uh, competence to do so, we might uh, have a really uh, intense conversation uh, that is certainly reminiscent here of a situation with our own uh, local Catholic high school. Uh, whether the pastoral and prudential thing is, you know, to, to say one is uh, welcome life and uh, under circumstances. So we won't uh, get into the moral uh, matter on that, but the judicial one was settled. Closer to home, Iowa. I don't know if many of our listeners are aware uh, at the Iowa Supreme Court, uh, Conchar versus Father Joe Pins and all uh, was decided over the uh, prior to the summer. But uh, could you just fill us in quickly in the roughly one minute plus we have remaining? Yeah. Sure. So the. Uh this was an interesting case for me. Uh, this was what was basically a wrongful discharge claim brought by a principal of an uh, Iowa Catholic school um, against the parish and the diocese, um, but styled as a defamation fraud claim. And, and the court said, well, look, this is requiring us to get into questions of religious disputes, basically, who, you know, we, we don't want to wade into the question of, you know, who makes a good principal for a Catholic school because principals of Catholic schools are significant figures in transmitting the faith. A particularly interesting part of this for me was that the, there was a concurrence 
<clears throat> saying, well, look, we, the Iowa Supreme Court, have never applied the ministerial exception doctrine, but we really should have here. Um, and the ministerial exception doctrine is stronger stuff. It's um, a, uh, a principle of jurisprudence saying exactly that, you know, that the government and I'm going to unfortunately have to uh, bring this to closure here. And uh, no for our listeners who want to pursue more, look up uh, Conchar. There's pins on that key phrase of the ministerial exemption. All of our staff in Catholic schools are considered as ministers representing their mission of yes. education. Thank you, Dan Balsarak. Keep up the good work. And uh, thank you for carrying the flag for us and the work you do on behalf of the entire conference. Of course. Thank you for having me. Well, this has been another edition of Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. Thank you to our guests and to all of our listeners in Iowa, Nebraska, and Wisconsin, or wherever you may be listening to Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. You can hear Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson every week on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org.